what did my friend Jonathan Pajot say? Giants are going to walk the earth once more, and we're going to live through that. This is going to happen this year, so get ready. As 2024 approaches, Peterson's thoughts are full of anticipation and concern as he contemplates the uncertain and tumultuous times that lay ahead. There are things, and everyone in the audience should know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just going to make your hair stand on end within the next year. How many of you clap? How many of you know what chat GBT is? Okay. So I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what chat GPT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. This is a big deal. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. So it's derived its models of the world from the analysis of human speech, essentially. It, it isn't using real world data yet, but that will be happening certainly within the next year. One thing Jordan Peterson fears in his thoughts for 2024 is the increasing impact of AI on our lives raising important questions about the future of work, privacy, and even our own humanity. Right now, Chad GPT only uses language. So to the degree it's intelligent, it's intelligent because of the intelligence that's encoded only in language. And if the linguistic corpus, so the body of text that we've all produced, is biased and warped in some way, that'll be built into the Chad GPT system. And, uh, along with whatever biases the programmers might have purposely or inadvertently put into the system. But Jim figures that the AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon. And that's basically what scientists do, right? Because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world. And if the hypothesis in the world fit, then you think, well, that's scientifically verified, and Keller thinks that, that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon. And pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because the tech is already in place. And chat GPT analyzes a very large corpus of text, and that corpus is growing all the time. Now, it's already sophisticated enough. I went on to it last week, and I said, okay, some of you know I, I've written these books, 12 Rules for Life, and then Beyond Order, 12 more rules, because, you know, you can't have enough rules. And I asked it, this is what I asked it to do. I said, write me an essay that's a 13th rule for Beyond Order, written in a style that combines the King James Bible with the Tao Te Ching. That's a pretty difficult that's pretty difficult to pull off, you know? Any one of those things is hard. The intersection of all three, that's impossible. Well, it wrote it in about three seconds, four pages long, and it isn't obvious to me, for better or worse, that I would be able to tell that I didn't write it. Right, right, and okay, and that's pretty impressive, although, you know, maybe not, it's, relationship to what I've written, but the fact that it could do that grammatically perfectly, right? And quite impressive philosophically, I also had it write an essay on the intersection between the Taoist version of ethical morality and the ethics that are outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, which it just nailed, got that dead right, Br brilliant. Again, it took it about three seconds. I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's gonna happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. There was a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla. He asked GPT, chat GPT, he said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a, 
engineer at Twitter, what 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. Right, and so, okay, so that's, that's already there. So then a university professor did this. He thought, oh, that's interesting. Any student will be able to write any essay on any topic with chat GPT. And uh, someone gave it an SAT, by the way, and it scored about as well as the average student in a well-functioning public university. So that's how smart it is. So that's basically an IQ test. He said, write me an essay, gave it a topic, wrote the essay. He said, now grade it said, if we can automate the students, we should be able to automate the professors too. And so it provided a complete comprehensive analysis of its own essay with grade. It wrote, uh, someone else asked it, write the screenplay and describe the characters for the next $900 million Hollywood blockbuster. It's like, bang, plot, characterizations. Then someone else took the descriptions of the actors and said, generate computer, photorealistic computer images for each actor. And all the AI systems could do that. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. This is going to happen this year. So get ready. We are definitely increasing our technological power. And you can imagine that that'll increase our capacity for tyranny and also our capacity for abundance. And then the question becomes, what do we need to do in order to increase the probability that we tilt the future towards Jerusalem and away from the beast? And the reason that I've been concentrating on helping people bolster their individual morality to the degree that I've managed that is because I think that whether the outcome is the positive outcome that in some sense Jim has been outlining or the negative outcomes that we've been querying him about, I think that's going to be dependent on the individual ethical choices of people well, at the individual level, but then cumulatively, right? So if we decide that we're gonna worship the image of the beast, so to speak, because we're mesmerized by our own reflection, that's another way of thinking about it, and we wanna be the victim of our own dark desires, then the IA revolution is gonna go very, very badly. Yeah. But if, if we decide that we're going to aim up in some positive way and we make the right micro decisions, well, then maybe we can harness this technology to produce a time of abundance in the manner that Jim is hopeful about. Okay, so now we have an AI model that can extract a model of the world from the entire corpus of language, all right? And it's, it's smarter than you, and it's gonna be a hell of a lot smarter than you in two years. So you can get ready for that too. But it's not that smart yet, because it's just a humanities professor at the moment. It doesn't test its linguistic knowledge against the real world. That's what a scientist does, right? You come up with a theory that's linguistically predicated and then you throw it against the world and see if it sticks. And then the world tells you whether or not your linguistic construction is valid. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world. And so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well, because they'll build a model human action. And so, and all of that's gonna come down the pipes within the next year. So hang on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen, because what did my friend Jonathan Pajo say? Giants are going to walk the earth once more, and we're gonna live through that, maybe. We have the opportunity to make the world a far better place, but with all that technological power comes the capacity for things to go seriously sideways, so we better be wise enough to master our technology. And again, I would say, well, that's all on you. You're all going to be participating in this intensely, and it's all going to depend more than you think on the decisions that each of you make. So you better make the right decisions, because you, you've got a lot more power than you think, and it's going to increase at a tremendous rate. So I don't see a, a, better, way, a better route forward than to make stronger people. What color skin emoji do you use? <laughs> if I used one, it would be black. <laughs> Why? Why not? It's so preposterous, all of that. You know, everything that's happened to Rogan, all this idiocy around race, 
this insistence that we can be reduced to our, our race, our ethnicity, our sexual identity. See, in, in the pursuit of truth, Peterson and Carlson shatter the illusion of a monolithic narrative, exposing the fractures that run deep within our societal fabric. This cricket player was facing racism by his own account. The question is, who, when, what, exactly? Because otherwise it degenerates into something like a discussion of structural racism. And when it becomes abstracted up to that level, first of all, that pits group against group, which I think is entirely counterproductive. And it actually doesn't address the issue. You know, racism is a, is a global and vague term. Summer of 2020, mobs of Joe Biden voters destroyed big parts of the city of Minneapolis. They looted stores, they burned a police station, but they did this, we were informed at the time, in the name of something called racial justice. But then we saw that some of the mob turned out to be privileged white kids, the children of lawyers from Bethesda, but they said they were rioting on behalf of so-called marginalized communities. They were working for racial justice, and because of that, they couldn't be punished for what they did. Nor, by the way, were they required to wear COVID masks like the rest of us. That's how holy their mission was. They're exempt from the normal laws of civilization. Kamala Harris raised money for them, like they were missionaries. You probably remember that. But do you recall what happened next in Minneapolis? That's the part of the story the media had no interest in covering, and they never do. The iron law of liberal social activism is that you never revisit the scenes of your moral victories. You give a speech declaring yourself a good person, and you go home. You don't return to Selma or Soweto or Ferguson, Missouri to see how the people there are doing because it's not about those people. It's about you and your newly enhanced moral authority, which is instantly convertible to political power and cash. Ask Barack Obama. There's one thing your average liberal understands perfectly well, it's that there's safety in numbers. Don't go out alone, bring 80 million people with you. It's safer that way. There is a reason a fundamental reason the Democrats are natural joiners and organizers and petition signers, and that their highest virtue is conformity. They know that as long as they're all wearing the same uniform, they'll probably be okay. This is why you'll see one person in Brookline or Bethesda raise a Ukrainian flag in the yard, and the very next day, everybody on the street will have one too. Suddenly, it's an entire neighborhood of foreign policy experts all specializing in Eastern European border disputes. It's amazing. Just last year, these very same people were all eminent virologists, every one of them with passionate views on the details of pandemic management. This is, in other words, not a movement of rugged individuals. This is a party based on the idea of the group, the bureaucracy, the blob. It's the party of weak, fearful people who are huddled together for collective power. So I told you a little bit about the things that distinguish liberals from conservatives, right? The conservatives are high in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, and low in trade openness. And so that means a conservative is someone who puts things in boxes, puts the boxes in order, and doesn't like them to be messed up, right? So they like the borders between things to remain determinate and and, and uh, what would you say, an inviolable. And I think that's true at every level from the conceptual all the way up to the political. I think the, the fundamental political question, and I think this is why the, the temperaments align across these political dimensions, is whether the borders between things should be open or closed. You see this reflected it worldwide right now in the arguments about immigration, right? Because the liberal types are saying, open the gates. And the conservatives are saying, wait, you don't know what you're inviting in. And you might say, well, who's right? And the answer is, you don't know. That's the thing. Because sometimes the right answer is, open the gates. These are interesting people. We could trade with them. We could learn from each other. And sometimes the answer is, don't bother. What's going to come in is going to wipe you out and kill you and really do it. The first thing I would say is that um, I'm not anti-feminist, per se. I mean, I think the idea that the world would benefit from the movement of talent from both sexes into the workplace as rapidly as possible is something that anyone with any sense should share given the rather uh, the rarity of talent and the necessity for for utilizing it. Um, I do stand by my original statement though that there's a brand of more radical feminism that 
that insists that our culture is best characterized as an oppressive patriarchy, and I think that, first of all, that that's an appalling sociological doctrine, and I think it has very negative psychological effects. And they won't be limited to men, because in, if it's true that there's something toxic, let's say, about masculinity per se, what that will ine inevitably mean is that as women adopt more masculine roles, traditionally, what, what is that toxicity somehow going to go away? for many decades used to pretend to understand that. That's why they opposed Jim Crow and the Nuremberg Law. But at some point, and it would be interesting to know precisely when and why, liberals enthusiastically embraced the racial spoil system they once claimed to hate. This is unfolding across the country, but it's especially prevalent in places liberals control. The more power liberals have, the more sweeping and rigid the race-based spoil system they create. In California, of course, they have absolute power. And that's why the government of San Francisco has just announced they will send you money if you have the right skin color. I read the American Psychological Association guidelines for the treatment of boys and men, and I know perfectly well that this is no strong ma straw mat. And it's not only devoted towards what you might describe as the more aggressive ends of masculine behavior. It's aimed at, at masculinity in a much broader, in a much broader range of there's a much broader range of accusations that are underlying, that are under the surface than that. And so I don't see in what way at all that it's a straw. Okay, I'm gonna... The battle of the sexes has finally ended after several million years of jockeying and strife. Men won, conclusively. We know this because yesterday was International Women's Day. That's the day we as a global community celebrate women. But if you looked closely at the women we were celebrating, you may have noticed a lot of them weren't actually women. They were lumpy looking dudes. And that was not accidental. In fact, it was a brilliant piece of sexual jujitsu. Sun Tzu could have written that strategy. Here you had men who are clearly craftier than they look, somehow convincing a whole lot of otherwise self-aware and highly educated women to praise them as living paragons of womanhood. Think about how hard it would be to sell that proposition. I'm going to steal your identity and then mock and degrade the immutable characteristics that define you as a person. And then as I do this, you are going to smile brightly and applaud and then give a speech about how liberated you feel. How about that? The whole thing is amazing. <clears throat> it's like watching a practical joke devised by the drunkest, most cynical fraternity brothers at the University of Alabama during a hungover breakfast at Denny's. You can picture them all there. In Baseball hats dipping Copenhagen, spitting into their coffee mugs. They can get girls to fall for that? No way! They'll never buy it! Oh, but they did! They bought it, and it wasn't really that hard to sell it. Liberals will fall for anything if they think it is fashionable and progressive. This is why I think orderliness is associated with disgust sensitivity, and it's one of the determining factors of conservative political belief. What happened when the Europeans came to North America? What happened when the Spaniards came to North America? 95% of the Native Americans died. Why? Because the Spaniards brought illness. Smallpox, measles, chickenpox, all these things that the Native Americans had absolutely no resistance to. There were hardly any diseases at all in North and South America. The Spaniards showed up within 50 to 100 years. 19 out of 20 of the Native Americans were dead. You never know what people are bringing with them. And so what that means is that how should you respond to people who are outside of your circle of familiarity? Well, the answer is, one, they might kill you in all sorts of ways. Two, they might bring with them things to trade that are of inestimable value. So you're stuck. It's like, how the hell are you going to reconcile that problem? And the answer is, well, we reconcile it temperamentally, roughly speaking. So half the people are temperamentally wired up to say, no, no, no. Let's keep the damn boxes closed. Took a long time to pack everything in there and to get it into order. And the liberals say, well, wait a minute. You don't know if you've got things in the right boxes to begin with. The things that you're keeping in there are getting stale and old. And maybe we need some new ideas and new people to rejuvenate the situation. It's like, that's political discussion. And the political discussion has to proceed because there's no way of solving that problem except by discussing it. The fact that my government had introduced a bill that required me to say things a certain way 
which was an unparalleled move in the history of Western democracies and something the Americans had made strictly unconstitutional, I believe, in 1942. So that was part of it. Part of it was I knew that this top-down mandated belief that confusion around gender identity was a positive occurrence to provide that freedom, let's say. I knew that for every person that saved, that would doom a thousand people, primarily girls, to a kind of psychological contagion as confusion about sex and gender identity ramped up. I knew the literature on psychological contagion. Not so long ago, it was a feature of high school biology class that biological sex is biologically real. It's detectable at the DNA level. You are born with it. You don't get to choose it. Just as you don't get to choose your height or your eye color, your susceptibility to breast cancer or a million other things. It's genetic. Genetics are real. Maybe unfortunately, but doesn't change the truth of it. Think about them as psychological epidemics. So the last one, the last one of any real size was the satanic daycare scares in the 1980s. You're probably not old enough to remember that, but the largest, longest sentences in U.S. criminal justice history were handed out often to women who were accused of late onset female sexual predation of children in daycare centers. Uh, the FBI invented a whole new category of perpetrator, a category that didn't exist, because <clears throat> there are no late onset female sexual, child, child sexual predators. They don't exist. But there were women who ob obtained prison sentences of several hundred years for hypothetically being involved in these satanic daycare abuse rituals. And there was a, it just swept across the whole country like the Salem witch trials, except at a much larger scale. There's a book called Satan's Silence that was written by a lawyer and a social worker that documents it. It's just unbelievable. There were stories about underground tunnels where children were being taken down and being well, every possible thing you could think of was happening to them, all in the name of like, satanic ritual. It was a contagion. That I like about the classic liberal take on the world, which, which I, and to which I think we owe Britain a great debt of gra gratitude for developing, perhaps more particularly than any other country, is that the individual is, is to be regarded as the sovereign uh, entity in the political understanding. That's not really a political claim. It's a claim that underlies politics. It's actually a theological claim. It's derived from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And because in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the suffering individual is the sovereign entity. And we established a political system based on that metaphysical axiom. And so I would say that to the degree that liberalism um, acts out the idea of the sovereignty of the individual, it's not an ism. It's it's not a political stance. It's far deeper than that, what it's predicated on. I mean, the idea that it would be a good thing for the world to arrange itself so that the talents of women were as available to use by the collective, let's say, by the group or by society as the talents of men, then obviously that's all for the good. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever um, because talent's in short supply and, and it's a foolish society that wastes it no matter where it manifests itself racial divisions or ethnic divisions or any of that, equality of opportunity, I can't see how you can be a sensible person. You know, one of the things I've been struggling with recently is the idea of, 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 of boundaries, let's say. We know absolutely, and, and this is relative to, relevant to your questions on progressivism, um, we know that the left can go too far and we know that the right can go too far. I mean, th I would say that's the abject lesson of the 20th century. Both can go too far. And we kind of know when the right goes too far. We probably think the right goes too far if you had to boil it down to one thing when people start making claims of racial or ethnic superiority. That seems to be the marker. But we don't know when the left goes too far. And the left, to be frank about it, isn't very careful about differentiating itself into those who are pursuing a reasonable progressive agenda and those who have seriously gone too far. And I would say that when people push an equality of outcome agenda, they've gone too far. Even though it's not as blatantly horrifying, let's say, as claims of ethnic or 
racial superiority, the consequences of playing that idea out in the world are seriously not good. So imagine that there's an emergency. Dragon. There's a dragon. Someone comes and says, there's a dragon. I'm the guy to deal with it. That's what the environmentalists say, the radical types who push limits to growth. And then I look at them and I think, okay, is that dragon real or not? As the Earth's ecosystem faces unprecedented destruction, Peterson's impassioned plea cuts through the noise, urging us to confront the inconvenient truths and take decisive action to mitigate the devastating effects of climate change. Well, uh, I've thought this for quite a long time, but, but it's more obvious now. Uh, we'll either subject ourselves to an internal or an external approximation of the apocalypse. And so we can either get our act together, which means to voluntarily subject ourselves to the flaming sword as an individual, or that will be impressed upon us as a necessity from without. And how intense that will get, we're, we're going to find out, because it's coming very fast, and this is going to be a rough winter. And we've done everything we could to make it rough, because this is, whatever happens this winter, is pretty much 100% self-inflicted. Well, I spent a lot of time, I don't really have beliefs about climate change, I wouldn't say. I mean, I think the climate is probably warming, but it's been warming since the last ice age, so I don't but know. But it's exactly dramatically what to make accelerated in the la even in the last couple yeah, of decades. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. and Possibly. It's not so obvious. I spent quite a bit of time going through the relevant literature. I, sp I read about 200 books on ecological, what would you call it, on ecology and e economy when I worked for the UN for about a two year period, and it's not so obvious what's happening. Just like with any complex system. The problem I have, fundamentally, isn't really the climate change issue. It's that I find it very difficult to distinguish valid environmental claims from environmental claims that are made as a, a what would you call it, secondary anti-capitalist front, essentially. So it's so politicized that it's very difficult to parse out the data from the politicization. My understanding is that the more radical voices on the climate amelioration front presume that it's simply impossible for upcoming generations of people in the West, and certainly people in the developing world, to aspire to anything even approximating the standard of living that we currently enjoy, and that they should bloody well get used to having less, and the sooner the better. And so the fact that young people are being priced out of the housing market, let's say, and, and face a more uncertain economic future in some ways, looks to me like a feature, not a bug. It's something that's actually part of the plan. Because if, you're, if your viewpoint is fundamentally Malthusian, you think, well, human beings will multiply until there's far too many of us, and there'll be a catas catastrophe as a consequence, which is pretty simple-minded biological modeling, by the way, then you're going to assume that everything has to be oriented towards placing extremely severe constraints on growth. And if that means impoverishing people now, while well, you're forestalling some hypothetical future catastrophe, and that's entirely justifiable. And it seems to me we're running down that road as fast as we possibly can, you know, with moral flag firmly in the air, saying to young people and the developing world, well, you know, we had it pretty good, but we probably burned up more than we should have. And I think it's time for you guys to pay. And so, and like, I don't buy any of that because I don't think the limits to growth model is biologically appropriate in the least because human beings aren't yeast in a Petri dish by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that the idea that we need to impoverish the poor and the young to save the planet will not only, is not only morally reprehensible and arrogant, but will also produce a far worse planet on the environmental front. I mean, I think all the data suggests that. And so... I don't exactly understand why people are buying into this with such avidity because there's no evidence whatsoever that is producing the results that are intended even by the people who are pushing forward the policies. Is the apocalypse looming on the environmental front? Yes or no? I'll just leave that aside for the time being. I think you can make a case both ways for a bunch of different reasons. And it's not a trivial concern. And we've overfished the oceans terribly. And there are 
environmental issues that are looming large. Whether climate change is the cardinal one or not is a whole different question, but we won't get into that. That's not the issue. You're clamoring about a dragon. Okay. Why should I listen to you? Well, let's see how you're reacting to the dragon. First of all, you're scared stiff and in a state of panic. That might indicate you're not the man for the job. Second, you're willing to use compulsion to harness other people to fight the dragon for you. So now not only are you terrified, you're a terrified tyrant. So then I would say, well, then you're not the Moses that we need to lead us out of this particular exodus. And maybe that's a neurological explanation. It's like, if you're so afraid of what you're facing, that you're terrified into paralysis and nihilism, and that you're willing to use tyrannical compulsion to get your way, you are not the right leader for the time. So then I like someone like Bjorn Lomberg or Matt Ridley or Marion Tupi, and they say, well, look, we've got our environmental problems, and uh, maybe there's a, there, you could make a case that there's a Malthusian element in some situations, but fundamentally the track record of the human race is that we learn very fast and faster all the time, to do more with less, and we've got this. And I think, yes, to that idea. And I think about it in a, in a fundamental way. It's like, I trust Lomberg, I trust Tupi, I trust Matt Ridley. They've thought about these things deeply. They're not just saying, oh, the environment doesn't matter, whatever the environment is. You know, the environment. I don't even know what that is. That's everything. The environment. I'm concerned about the environment. Like, which is, how is that different than saying I'm worried about everything? How are those statements different semantically? Well, and tenders of the garden, right? Keepers of the garden. Uh, that's our divine uh, obligation, let's say. that There's something in that. that that's part of what drives the environmentalist ethos. On the positive front, um, the negative front is something like, you know, human beings are a cancer on the planet, and we're the despoilers of nature, and we're viewed as antithetical to the natural order instead of an emergent part of the natural order, and uh, we're we're obliged to shoulder a like an anti-nihilist burden of guilt for violating the natural order, and like you can see an impulse in that to to tending, but but you can also see it's war it it being warped in a terrible way by by guilt and shame and accusation and and envy and the desire for revenge on God for creating such an appalling place, let's say. And that's what it is most fundamentally. And that's the spirit of Cain. Because people have gone after me because I don't buy the climate models. Well, I think about the climate models as extended into the economic models. Because the climate model is, well, there's going to be a certain degree of heating, let's say by 2100. It's like, okay, some of that might be human generated. Some of it's a consequence of warming after the ice age. This has happened before, but fair enough. Let's take your presumption. Although there are multiple presumptions and any error in your model multiplies as time extends, but to have it your way. Okay, now we're going to extend the climate model, so to speak, into the economic model. So I just did an analysis of a paper by Deloitte, third biggest company in the US, 300,000 employees, major league consultants. They just produced a report in May. I wrote an article for it in The Telegraph, which I'm going to release this week on my YouTube channel. Said, well, if we get the climate problem under control economically, because that's where the models are now being generated on the economic front, so now we have to model the environment, that's the climate, and we have to model the economy, and then we have to model their joint interaction, and then we have to predict 100 years into the future, and then we have to put a dollar value on that, and then we have to claim that we can do that, which we can't, and then this is our conclusion. We're going to go through a difficult period of privation because if we don't accept limits to growth, there's going to be a catastrophe 50 years in the future or thereabouts. And so to avert that catastrophe, 
We are going to make people poorer now. How much poor? Well, not a lot compared to how much richer they're going to be, but definitely, and they say this in their own models, definitely poorer, definitely poorer than they would be if we just left them the hell alone. And so then I think, okay, poorer, eh? Who? Well, let's look at it biologically. We've got a hierarchy, right, of stability and security. That's a hierarchy or one type. You stress a hierarchy like that, a social hierarchy. So there's birds in an environment and an avian flu comes in. And then you look at the birds in the social hierarchy and the, the, the low ranking birds have the worst nests. So they're most exposed to wind and rain and sun and farthest from food supplies and most exposed to predators. And so those birds are stressed, which is what happens to you at the bottom of a hierarchy. You're more stressed because your life is more uncertain. You're more stressed. Your immunological function is compromised because of that. You're sacrificing the future for the present. An avian flu comes in and the birds die from the bottom up. That happens in every epidemic. You die from the bottom up. Okay, so they say when the aristocracy catches a cold, the working class dies of pneumonia. All right, so now we're going to make people poorer. Okay, who? Well, we know who we make poorer when we make people poorer. We make those who are barely hanging on poorer. And what does that mean? It means they die. And so what the Deloitte consultants are basically saying is, well, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, but according to our models, a lot of poor people are going to have to die so that a lot more poor people don't die in the future. It's like, okay, hold on a sec. Which of those two things am I supposed to regard with certainty? The hypothetical poor people that you're going to hypothetically save 100 years from now? Or the actual poor people that you are actually going to kill in the next 10 years? Well, I'm going to cast my lot with the actual poor people that you're actually going to kill. And so, and then I think further, it's like, well, okay, the Deloitte consultants, have you actually modeled the world? Or is this a big advertising shtick? designed to attract your corporate clients with the demonstration that you're so intelligent that you can actually model the entire ecosystem of the world, including the economic system, and predict it 100 years forward. And isn't there a bit of a moral hazard in making a claim like that? Just like, just a trifle, especially when... So I talked to Bjorn Lomberg and Michael Leon last week. I accepted the UN uh, estimates of starvation this coming year. 150 million people will suffer food insecurity. Food insecurity. Yeah, food insecurity. That's the bloody buzzword. Famine. Well, Michael Yon thought 1.2 billion, and then that it'll spiral because he said what happens in a famine is that the governments go nuts, crazy. The governments destabilize, and then they appropriate the food from the farmers. Then the farmers don't have any money then they can't grow crops. And I think, yeah, that's exactly what they do. That's exactly what would happen. 